Chapter 9, July 5th, 1780. We went on for two more hours. We'd wasted a lot of time with Mrs. Martin and her children, and I couldn't get shut of the nagging doubt that she hadn't taken them to Uncle Henry, that she'd turned and fled. Well, I couldn't worry about the, uh, worry the matter. We had our own concerns. The sun was lower in the horizon across the watery river when we stopped. I figured we'd gone about 15 miles this day. I jumped down from the wagon seat and looked around. To the left of me was the river, with its usual sandy shores, behind it the tangled undergrowth and pines, silent and foreboding. We ourselves were on a sandy path in a thicket of overgrown vines and interlocking trees. I wish I could run down to the river. I wish I could wade right in. The waters ran low and were caped with white in several places. And then I slided a boulder the size of a small pony on a rise a short distance above us. I think I know this place, I told Ms. Melindy. I think I came here fishing with Johnny once. And if I'm right, there should be a little stream a bit yonder. I pointed through the trees. I'll go see, and I'll take a bucket and fetch some water for the mules. Help me down, she said. I did so. She took off her straw hat and wiped her face with a kerchief. Never mind about me. This time, you best take the musket. Don't know, but what you might run into civilians. Sometimes they'd be worse than soldiers. I led her to the shelter of the boulder, fetched the musket and bucket, and set off. Within several minutes, I found the south running stream. I sat down my musket, took off my shoes and hose, and waded in. The bottom was sandy, and the water felt so good on my feet and ankles. I was t tempted to take off my petticoat and chemise and slip in. I wagered that in the middle of the stream the water would be up to my waist. But I had Ms. Melindy to worry about, and the mules who were waiting to be unharnessed for the night and fed and watered. So I filled my bucket, put my hose and shoes back on, and started back. I left the musket. I'd have to come back for more water for us. Before I even cleared the thicket of vines and trees, I heard voices. I set the bucket down and peered through the trees. A woman stood over Ms. Melindy holding a musket. I heard Ms. Melindy's voice, low and rambling. The woman was looking around. The musket was pointed right at Ms. Melindy. I didn't think. What should I have done was run back for my own musket. But instead, I ran down the slope. Don't! You leave her be! Now the musket was pointed at me. Stand where you are. Stand fast. I stood, thinking bleakly, that I should never have left my musket. And then I stood thinking, numbly, how it was the second time this day I'd been so confronted by a woman in the wilderness. And in both instances, I'd felt the intruder. Come on down here, slowly. I obeyed, walked toward them. Miss Melinda had struggled to her feet and was leaning next to the boulder. She was tired and of a sudden looked smaller and older than I'd yet perceived her to be. The woman with the musket was tall and angular, and the first thing I noticed was that the right side of her face was red and swollen. The second thing was that she was well-dressed but plain. Her face was not burnt from the sun, and she appeared to know very much where and who she was. Who are you? she demanded. Caroline Whitaker from Camden. And what caused you embrace Caroline Whitaker of Camden, the king or those tramples beneath his boots? Those he tramples. My father is the leading rebel in Camden. Haven't you heard of John Whitaker? Everyone has. But what luancy does he allow his daughter to go roaming around when the British are laying waste to the countryside? My father is in prison, put there by Cornwallis. She took measure with cold gray eyes. I could see at once that she did not believe me. I went on to explain our mission, how we were on our way to bring my brother home. By whose leave? I just stared at her. No one just roams the countryside these days without someone's leave. Do you have written permission from someone? I knew I was trapped then, but there was not I could do about it. Rodon, I said, Colonel Rodon, who occupies our home. I drew the letter out of my pocket and gave it to her. She read it. It says here your brother's a loyalist and was fighting at Charleston. Yes, I could not betray Johnny, not even to save myself. She handed the letter back to me. You're going to fetch home your loyalist brother and I should trust you? She glanced suspiciously, suspiciously at Miss Melindy then. Is she the best Rodon could send to accompany you? She knows the art of psy psy psychic. I said, my brother is very sick, and she's my grandmother. The last part was said in defiance. Let her think what she would. She wasn't about to believe me no matter what. She didn't. Come along with me, both of you. Miss Melindy started toward the wagon. Where? I demanded. To my place. It's about an hour east of here. For what? She glared at me. Look, I don't know what kind of claptrap you're giving me, but listen and listen well. I hadn't, haven't time to bandy with, a bandy about with you. You were an hour ago visited by Huck and his men. My son and son-in-law were just returned from Sumter's camp and were employed in melting my pewter dishes for the purpose of, purpose of making musket balls. My good pewter dishes, do you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I said. 
Huck's men were on us before we were aware of it. They seized my son and son-in-law, discovered the musket balls in their pockets, said they had murderous designs against the king's men, tied them with ropes, and pronounced immediate sentence. They are to be hanged at sunrise in the morning on the 12th. A group of redcoats took them off. Then Huck himself searched my house and threw our family Bible into the fire because he said it was from such a book that we have become damned rebels. I fetched it from the fire, and for my trouble he struck me with a sword across my face. Well, that was a dear blow, and he shall soon pay for it. Now come along, I say. I helped Miss Melindy into the wagon. I put the bucket of water in because the mules needed it. At first I thought to ask to be allowed to go back and fetch my musket, but decided against it. If she let us go, I'd come back and fetch it, I thought. Are we your prisoners? I asked. Until tomorrow morning, she said. She walked beside the wagon, leading us along a path I hadn't noticed before. We went through a dark part of the woods that was less dense and looked frequently traveled. She never wavered with that musket either, kept it on us the whole time. In an hour, we came to her place. It was a lovely small plantation, well kept, and with the fields and orchard in full growth of the season. But it seemed deserted. The windows of the two-story house were all open, but no activity came from inside. Mary, she called out. For a moment, there was no answer. Then the barn door opened, and a girl came dashing out on a sorrel mare. She looked about to be, to be about Georgia Ann's age, but that was where any similarity ended. She wore a man's tricon on her head, and a long braid hung down her back. Her simple linen petticoat looked as if it had been dyed with tea. It was hiked up as she rode astride. She wore men's boots and a wee skilt over her kermis. A musket was tied into the mare. Her face was full of freckles. Who are they, mother? she asked. The horse pranced a bit, yearning to be off, but she controlled it well. Don't know. Found them by the river. Just as you thought, Mary. Claim to be rebels, but I think they're telling me a pack of lies. I'm holding them until you get a good head start, likely overnight. Where? Mary asked. In the corn crib. You'd best be on your way. Will you be all right, mother? Your face. I'll be all right. You'd best put some ice on it. And with that, the girl rode off, raising dust in the barnyard. How I envied her, the way she galloped off on that horse. She rode well. How long had it been since I'd been able to ride like that? The woman looked at us. My name's McClure, she said. My husband and his men made a stand at the iron works of Colonel Hill, but were outnumbered. The enemy destroyed the works. I'm sorry, but you'll both have to stay in the corn crib for the night. My daughter is off to carry the news of what's happened here to Sumter's camp. I have a husband and two other sons there. She led us to the corn crib. It was empty except for some old stocks. I surveyed it, dismayedly. I know you don't believe my story, I told her, but my brother lies wound, wounded up north. He's waiting for us to come home and fetch him. You were going to stay the night where I found you, she said, so you'll just spend it here, is all. In the morning, you can be on your way. Go on, in with you, both of you. I can't expect Miss Melindy to sleep in here, I argued. She's an old lady. Can't you see how old she is? It's all right, child, Miss Melindy said. Come, we'll fetch blankets from the wagon. I can give you something for that face, Miss McClure. No, thank you. I'll be fine. We fetched blankets, water, a sack of food, and Miss Melindy's pouch with her remedies in the corn crib. Then, while Miss McClure still had that musket fixed on us, we fed and watered and unhitched the mules. Then we got into the corn crib. She locked it securely. I'll send my servant out with supper, she promised. We have supper, I said. I knew it was ungracious. I knew I was being what Mama would call boldly vigorous, but I didn't care. I arranged the blankets over the dried corn stalks, making a sort of bed. I was worried about Miss Melindy, but I needn't have been. She settled right in. Out of the food basket, she took what remained of the corn dodgers. Chicken sploit by now, she said. Best we eat the hard tack. I don't want anything. Best you eat anyways. You weren't so full stubborn, we could have had a hot supper. Don't want any of her supper. I'd rather starve. Eat your pride, maybe, she said. You hush, I warned. Woman's only doing what she gotta do, making sure her own don't get hung. You should know what that means. When you had done the same to save your friend? She was right, of course, but I didn't care. Mind your tongue about Kit, I told her. There was nothing I could do to save him. Didn't say there was. Well, mind your tongue anyway. She looked at me out of bleary eyes. Where's the musket? Back at the spring. I left it there. Why you leave it? Because I was intending to go back, and because I was carrying a bucket of water for the mules. That's why for. If when you brung it instead of leaving it there, we wouldn't be in this mess now, smart girl. She took a big bit of corn dodger. Smart girl with pride. I brung some salt. Want some salt on your pride? Mind your tongue. You don't tell me to mind my tongue. I say what I please. Your servant, I snapped at her. And if you don't mind, when we get back home, I'll have you punished. She slapped me then. It was so fast that I didn't know what happened. She scarce moved, but reached out. 
with her own withered hand like a snake and slapped my cheek. I blinked, reeled. My face stung. My mouth fell open. I be a servant, she said, but I be your grandmother. The hopelessness of my situation came over me, then like a downpour of cold rain. Here I was, in a corn crib, on some rebel woman's plantation, a prisoner with a negro woman who was my grandmother, with cold corn dodgers and hardtack to eat, far from home. I wanted my mother. I wanted my daddy, whom I not, might never see again. I was tired and hurt and sore. My hands had blisters from holding the reins without gloves. My arms ached. So did my head. I wanted my own bed, even if it was on that upstairs chamber with rod on and his officers playing cards below. I wanted to be home. I commenced crying. It was the only thing to do. I cried so that my whole body shook with the effort. Then, all of a sudden, I was enveloped in Ms. Melinda's arms, bawling my heart out against her thin bosom while she held me and struck my tangled hair. You're just like your mama. You know that? I sniffed. Which one? Your real mama, head like a rock, would never listen. It's what brung her to ruin. Wouldn't listen to me, no way. Got herself smitten with your daddy. I told her and told her, but only gonna dally with you. What will come of it? But she don't listen no how. You're gonna regret it the rest of your life, I told her. To your dying day. And I know she still do. Through the top of the corn crib, I'd been watching the stars as I leaned against Ms. Melindy. And then, it was as if those stars burst into a million pieces. I pulled back from her and wiped my nose with the sleeve of my short gown. What do you mean she still do? She gave no reply. She's dead. How could she regret it? She is dead, isn't she? The look on her eyes told me before she did. I think she would have sat there all turned in on herself, a mouth, a grim slash, and never told me. Not even if I beat it out of her, but the look in her eyes had already done it. She isn't dead, is she? I leaned forward. I gripped her shoulders. You must tell me, Miss Melindy. Please tell me. Where is she? She shook her head slowly. No profit in it, child. Yes, there is profit in it. Tell me. Why isn't she dead? They all said she was, but now I know. I suppose I've always known. Something inside me always knew that what they told me were lies. I just never wanted to face it. And here, now, in this godforsaken place, I want to face it. I want to know. Where is my mother? You can't tell him I told you. No, I won't. You promise now. Or they sell Miss Melindy off, and then you have nobody t to tell you nothing about your mama ever again. I promise. Tell me. So she did. Sold, she said. Sold? Where? Some man come one day, right before you was brought to the big house to live. Your daddy sell her to this man. Where did he take her? I hear his things, but I don't know if they be true. Tell me, the West Indies. The West Indies? Why? She shrugged. I saw tears in her eyes. And then she put her hands over those eyes and wept. Quietly, she wept. The only way I knew she was crying was by seeing her shoulders shake. I sat there for a while, not knowing what to do. Overhead, the stars were just the stars again. For somewhere in the distance, a hooty owl called, then another night bird. I heard a horse whinny in the barn, saw candles in the house windows. The world was falling back into place, starting to make sense to me. My daddy had sold my real mother. Of course! That was why Miss Melinda hated him so. He'd sold not only her sister Kate, but my real mother, with the slender hands and the pert little nose, light-skinned, the daughter of Miss Melinda and Old Boney. And there was the reason Old Boney held a grudge against Daddy. There was the thing between them that I could never get a purchase on. I spoke. My voice was hoarse at first. Georgia Ann told me that Mama and Daddy arrived at some kind of an, of an understanding. When I was brought to live in the house, I said, Was that it? That I would be brought to live with my, the family only if my real mother was sold? She nodded yes. But who made the demand? Was it Mama? Sarah? I don't know how they come to it, child. I don't know. I leaned back against the corn crib and stared up at the stars again. My real mother was still alive. I couldn't absorb it. It would take time. A life somewhere in the West Indies. Would I ever get used to it? How could I? I feel betrayed by all of them, I said. My whole family, even Johnny. She took her hands away from her face. She wiped her face with her apron. Only as one who betray you was your mama, she said. Mama Sarah? She took her, She shook her head. Your real mama. By doing what she done. I got no love for your daddy, but your mama knew what she was about with him. She knew the chance she was taking. After you was with me for a while, when Johnny and Georgia Ann made you their playmate and brung you up to the house, 
after they saw what a beautiful child you were. But Pop, what could your daddy do? Leave you in the quarters? A white chiller? Made you a slave? I pondered that, tried to picture it. I couldn't. What would have become of me? Would I have been a servant for Georgia Ann? Johnny? Georgia Ann would have allowed it, but not Johnny. Never Johnny. Still, if the price for my being part of the family was that my mother was sold off, how could I abide it? What do they do in the West Indies? I asked Mrs. Melendy. Slaves, what do they do? Sugar plantations, she said. And when I pushed her, that was all she would say. So I knew it was bad. It's hot, isn't it? I asked. Hotter than here in South Carolina. She did not answer, but her eyes did. I shuddered and was about to say something else when someone came across the barnyard with a lantern in hand, a negro servant from the house. She had a tray of food. I could smell it. It was soup. I gotta open this door, she said, and give you these vitals, but you gotta promise you ain't gonna get away or I'd be in trouble. Trouble we got enough of, Miss Melindy said. All we wants to do now is sleep. So the door was opened. The tray handled, handed through. There were wooden spoons and bowls, and Miss Melindy set the whole business down on the floor between us and spooned the soup out of a large turn into the bowls. The door was latched again, and the servant disappeared. It was some kind of stew. I don't know what, but never did anything taste so good to me. And after we ate, we set the tray in a corner and made up our makeshift beds, but I could not sleep. Thoughts swirled in my head. My mother is alive somewhere at this very moment, perhaps looking up at the same stars. How could that be? I didn't know how any thing could be lying there. I loved my daddy, but he sold her off. How did I feel about him now? Was it wrong to still love him? What about Mama Sarah? Had it been done at her biting? And if so, how could I go home and face her, live with her again in that house? But if Mama hadn't been sold off, if she'd been kept on the place and I lived in quarters with her? I heard Miss Melindy scuffling about. Then I heard, felt a hand on my shoulder. Put this on your tongue, she said. What is it? A leaf. Help you sleep. Open your mouth. I did so. Felter said something on my tongue. It was bitter tasting. It will melt for you knows it, she said. Lie back. And for you knows it, you feel nothing. I lay back and waited. All around me were night sounds. Cicadas, frogs from the distance croaking, the hooty owl again, and the rustling of a slight breeze in the trees. I smelled the farm smells, just like home. Tears came to my eyes, and I thought my heart would burst inside me. Home. Would I ever be there again? Did I want to be? And then, in the next instant, I felt Ms. Melendy's nothing.